The journey and the dream, our story. Life forced me to grow up. When I was a child, I used to talk like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways aside. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. We began to make marriage plans. It was as if I had been born again. All the years of tears and sorrow were behind me, or so I thought. God has sent me the knight in shining armor I had dreamed about as a young girl. We were busily planning our wedding. Then one day, I received a phone call from Mama. She was worried. Daddy, who was meticulous, forever straightening our pictures and etc., was leaving cabinet's doors open. I playfully chided Mama insisting she was noticing these things because it was now just the two of them, and she did not have the rest of us to keep her occupied. But then she said, My father, a mathematical genius who did long division and multiplication in his head, was having problems adding simple figures. That's when I agreed we had a problem and called our doctor's office in Manhattan to make an appointment for Daddy to go and see him. The minutes seemed like hours and the hours like years as Bob and I stood by the phone waiting for Mama's call from the doctor's office. Finally, the ominous words, Daddy has to go and see a neurologist. Dr. Stone says it doesn't look good. I cried, but he will be all right. He'll be all right, but Daddy will not be all right. My strong father, who had never even had a headache, rarely had a cold, had a tumor on the brain which was going to take his life. December 21st, 1958, Bob and Penny get married. Months have passed since Daddy had his operation and soon it was December 21st, 1958, our wedding day. No church wedding, just a judge to officiate in our tiny apartment with our immediate families present. Daddy had lost his auburn wavy hair and now white stubble bravely rose to the surface. Only one result of the chemotherapy he had been subjected to. The cancer was threatening his life, draining all his strength, but nothing could stop him. There he was, dressed and smiling. He would give his daughter's hand to the young man who had already become a son. As I walked beside my father, the man who had always been my strength, instead of him holding me up, I helped him lead me to Bob. It will not be more than six months when he will leave us. After the wedding reception in our apartment, we left to go to both children's schools to watch them perform in Christmas pageants. After that, we went to a hotel downtown for our one-night honeymoon. It might have not been fancy, but we were in love and everything looked beautiful. And for one night, we could forget Daddy was dying. From the minute Bob entered my life, my life became his life, my children his children, my parents his parents. Now, prior to our marriage, Mama and Daddy had been living in my apartment in New York. After his operation, Daddy had to go to the hospital for chemotherapy treatments and could not make the 53-mile trip back and forth several times a week from my parents' home. When we married, Bob supported me in my wish that Daddy remain with us in our apartment in spite of everyone else's strong objections. When they argued it wasn't healthy for the children to see him dying, I said, right now I must be for my father. I will take care of my children later. When my children later showed signs of hidden hurts, I struggled with the decision I had made, but at the time, all I could think of was my father. I did not want him to spend his last days in a hospital. We set up a hospital bed in the living room so that Daddy would not feel cooped up in the bedroom, away from life and all the activity. Mama and the children slept in the bedrooms, and newly married Bob and Penny slept in the hide bed across from him. Now, Daddy and I had always talked. He was my hero, but now it was as if he was trying to jam a lifetime into the few months he had left. Daddy slept during the day and told us stories through the night, stories I had never heard before, 
things he had reserved for Mama. To add to Bob's sleepless nights, Daddy would not allow Mama or me to help him to the bathroom, but instead insisted on waiting for Bob to come home from work. Bob cared for him, gave him his medication, almost carried him to and from the toilet, always lovingly. One night, as all our pretenses that Daddy was going to get well were growing thin, my father turned to me and said, No matter whatever happens, remember always what Bob has done for your father. I was devastated, seeing life draining out of my once young-looking strong father who, at 62 years old, had not had a gray hair in his head. I did not know if my children were eating, sleeping. All I knew was my father was dying and I wanted to fight for his life. Bob got them ready for school, prepared their lunch boxes. He took them to the park or to the planetarium on weekends to try to get them away from the angel of death who insisted on filling our home and life with helplessness and grief. It's more like yesterday than 42 years ago that a priest came to our apartment with the last sacrament of the church, extreme unction. At first, Mama fought our decision to call a priest. She was concerned that Daddy would then give up, believing he was dying. We had all been playing the same game, Daddy trying to have us believe he will be all right and us doing our best to try to convince him and ourselves this will all pass and Daddy will be all right. I helped Daddy into the bedroom. He insisted I stay with him. I cannot remember him confessing any sins. All I can recall are strong hands pressing me down on my knees. I looked about, but the priest was facing us and there was no one else in the room. Now that I know more about the sacrament of extreme unction, I believe it must have been when my father received his viaticum. Daddy tried to prepare his little bride, as he always saw my mother, for the inevitable. The week before he died, he took my mother aside and said, Darling, I am going home. When she protested, he told her he had had a dream. My nana, my mother's mother, had come to him with the late Monsignor Silvestri, his good friend, and told him they had a place for him. When she began to cry, pleading with him to hold on and believe he would get well, he gently told her to turn to Mother Mary. Now, we have been a strictly go-to-church-every-Sunday Catholic family, with Mama staying at home and cooking. We only took Mother Mary out at Christmas and Easter. Having very little relationship with Mary, I wonder why he told my mother to turn to the Mother of God. Later, when we went to the cemetery, what did I see but a statue of the Blessed Mother looking down on where my father's body will rest? Daddy goes home. Nine painful months having passed, Daddy entered into a deep coma. Dr. Stone lovingly said, This fine gentleman will no longer feel any pain. He is dying. That night, I could hear Daddy breathing hard, holding on as if he had to do something before he left us. I wept in Bob's arms. I just wanted to say one more time, Daddy, I love you. Bob said, Oh, that knew. You two told each other every day of your life. He knew. The next day, I had to move our car to the opposite side of the street. When I came out to the apartment, I overheard Mama telling my sister-in-law she thought she heard Daddy say something. Afraid my mother was in denial, I gently but firmly reminded her the doctor had said Daddy could no longer hear nor speak. But as always, mothers are right. To please her, I went over to my father and said, Oh, Daddy, I love you so. And he replied, I adore you, Blondie. He never said another word. Daddy waited till the children were asleep, till my two brothers came and his family was by his side to go home. It was midnight. They came for my daddy and too soon there was only the sound of quiet weeping in the apartment. Finally, thinking of the children and what this will mean to them, I ordered the hospital bed to be removed from the room. At a time like this, you do not think with your head, but with your heart. I wanted to spare them the pain. 
How taking away the bed will do that, I cannot now answer. It was just something I had to do. The next morning, they awakened to a living room painfully empty, bare. It was as if a thief had entered the apartment and robbed us of a treasure which could never be replaced. Nano, as they called my father, was no longer there. Our daughter began to cry as I unsuccessfully attempted to share without breaking down that Nano had died. Our son, his namesake, little more than seven years old, looked at us incredulously and said, Don't you believe in your religion? Don't you remember Jesus said we will be in heaven with him? You should be dancing and singing, for Nano is in heaven with all the angels. I will remember that later when the time will come to mourn once more. I neither ate nor slept the three days my daddy was laid out. I remember the first time we viewed his still body. In the room next door, a young girl was screaming. As I let silent tears stream down my face, I turned to my father and thought, Why did you teach me that young ladies do not scream? They are always to be well-mannered and proper. I wanted to scream. At the funeral parlor, my father-in-law tried to console me with, Can I take your father's place? I almost lost it. I looked at him incredulously and blurted out, No one can ever take my father's place. I would eat those words a few years later when my own dear husband will humbly ask, Will I ever be the man Papa was? Oh, Lord, he had grown into every inch the man my father had been and over the years will become that and so much more. The sad journey back to the old neighborhood. We brought Daddy back to the old neighborhood, where friends still remember the compassion he had for everyone. They hadn't forgotten that during the Depression, he had gone to store after store begging for food for those who had not much less than we had, never once taking a morsel for his family. But somehow, God always provided. Now this men, women, and children, whom he had called family, were there to pay their last respects, to say goodbye one last time. After three days of people streaming in and out of the mortuary, the time came to close the coffin in an important part of our life. People lined the streets. Men placed their hats over their hearts. Women sobbed into handkerchiefs. Children waved, and a stillness cut through the air. There was not a sign of the iceman, nor the push cart with fresh vegetables. Bells clanging, voices cheerfully calling out their wares. Life stood still, respectfully allowing death to pass by. My world had come to an end. An anger filled my heart. He was so young. He never hurt anyone. There are so many people living who were wounding others. Why did God take my father from me? Everyone grieves differently. My mother appears strong on the outside. Always a rock of Gibraltar, she buried her grief as she endeavored to console her children. She will say, Daddy would have gladly given his life in place of the little children who were dying in the hospital of cancer. That was the real tragedy. Parents seeing their children dying. I selfishly said that was their cross and this was mine. I just knew there could be no greater pain than I was feeling. But the world will show me a fool, for there was to be an even greater cross waiting for me to carry. The hearse mournfully traveled slowly through the familiar streets I knew as a child. A steady stream of cars with their lights on, following close by. Looking around at all the familiar sights, memories kept coming back. Fire hydrants were not open with children running under them to cool off from the sweltering heat. We passed the bakery where Daddy would go early in the morning before Mass on Sunday to buy a custard pie freshly baked with powdered sugar crowning this delectable mastery. The Italian bakery where we got hot scaletti, Sicilian bread, was no longer there. Tears escaped from eyes which had not closed for three days. Then it hit me. I'm no longer my daddy's little girl. 
Where did the time go? The hearse splashed puddles left by the sanitation department cleaning the streets. But to me, they were not puddles of water, but puddles of tears. All I could see were men taking my father from me. Memories, memories that I had long forgotten. We passed Angie's candy store, where as children we all shopped pennies in our hands, deliberating collectively over how many candies we could purchase for one penny, and then, after industriously, fastidiously, considering the choices before us, negotiating the best price for one soda which seven of us will share. But now Angie and the corner candy store were gone. Some of the old gang had already gone to the father. I looked about and thought, do children still go to candy stores? The drugstore was next, not the pharmacy with everything from groceries to ready-to-wear to some pharmaceutical wares. No, this was an old-fashioned drugstore with a pharmacist who was more like a small-town doctor suggesting inexpensive medicine for our everyday aches and colds. Where had the time gone? As we rounded the corner of the block where we once lived, before me was the very spot where local politicians postured on the back of open trucks, making promises they knew they couldn't or wouldn't keep. Where have all the push carts gone? We paused before the eight-family apartment house where I was born and spent the first ten years of my life. I strained to see my grandmother calling her order down to me from our front parlor window, three floors above, as I shopped at the horse-driven wagon that brought fresh fruit and vegetables to our block each day. Do children still run up the three flights of stairs to apartments as I did, clutching bags of fruit and vegetables proudly? Does the push cart vendor's Italian sales pitch still ring through the neighborhood and then trail off into the distance? Fresh fruit picked off the trees today, vegetables straight from the farm to you. Now, with the death and sorrow clouding my vision and memory, my heart no longer raced excitedly, as it had long ago when I had bolted up those stairs to our floor and pushed the door open, dashing into the kitchen of our railroad flat apartment, into the open arms of my nana, to praises and hugs, kisses and excitement. How long ago was it? How many lifetimes ago was it? when I opened my little shopping bag and waited, trying to keep from jumping up and down, my grandmother inspecting our by, looking at me with such love, such pride, saying the magical words, Ah, I fought the bono, chato mio. Well done, my life. Seven days a week, the door to our apartment was always open. People from the neighborhood would come to Nana when they needed money to buy something to eat or when one of their children was in trouble, seeking help, but more often consolation. We were victims of the Depression, like everyone else. We were poor, although I never knew it. I thought we were rich. Nana always seemed to have something, a little food, a little money, a kind word, an ear to listen, time for anyone and everyone who came to the open door of our apartment. Everyone called her a saint. She was a peacemaker. La Shalida, she will say to my mother, when my paternal grandmother caused friction between my mother and father, or when we children had done something naughty, maybe carrying on a miniature war within our walls. I never heard her join in with the neighborhood chroniclers sharing the latest gossip. Instead, she will interrupt them right at the starting gate with, if you know something bad about someone, especially a young woman, Lifting up her apron, hide her under your apron. After all, she could be your daughter. I never heard my nana say an angry or malicious word against anyone. The first six years of my life were spent with my maternal grandmother. She was mother, grandmother, confidant, teacher, friend. She took care of me during the day while my parents went to work and my brothers went to school. We even slept together in a full-size bed. In the cold winter nights, without my mother's disapproving knowledge, she'd allowed me to sneak between the blankets until the ice-cold sheets warmed up. My mind wandered, 
The Lord mercifully bringing me back to the old days when Daddy was not dead, just away working. Nana was alive, and the sweet scent of orange peels roasting on top of our wood and coal stove drifted through our apartment. Bread was baking in the oven, a special miniature loaf just for me and our daily tea party. To this day, the one food I find most difficult to resist is Italian bread. Nana, my best friend, was back, at least for this little time. I was not a grown-up with grown-up cares. My thoughts and heartbeats traveled to the yard in back of our apartment house, and I could see Nana precariously lowering a basket full of wonders and surprises. Cookies, hot Italian bread, tiny tea service, high heels, and plumed hat. Suddenly, I was a child once again, and I was carefully climbing down the fire escape, my cousin Joey, my friend Dickie, and others scurrying over their fences to my backyard. We were playing and scrapping. Then things got too hot. The fighting went beyond the talking stage to a physical one. My playmates were crying, climbing up their respective fire escapes to their mothers for help, consolation, and justice, claiming I had hurt them. I, too, was running, crying to my defender, my best friend, my nana. My mother and father always knew when we kids had done something wrong. My nana had this huge apron. It seemed that she was always hiding us under her apron. Now that I think of it, Mother Mary was always with me. Mother Mary covered and is still covering me, my whole family, our whole ministry, with her heavenly mantle. Mother Mary protected me when I was a little girl, even though I didn't know it. You see, my grandmother's name was Mary, and her apron was the mantle of my earthly mother Mary protecting me. As my grandmother shielded us children, I envision Mother Mary now turning to her son Jesus, her mantle shielding us, the children of the world, pleading with him to give us yet another chance, then turning toward us, her mantle covering her beloved son, pleading with us to stop hurting Jesus by our selfishness, our apathy, our sinfulness. My mother told me later on, after Nana left us to go and live with Nano, Grandpa, and Jesus in heaven, that I was supposed to have been named after her mother, my Mary, my Nana. According to the Sicilian custom, the first daughter is named after the father's mother and the second after the mother's. My sister, who died at three weeks old, had been named Pauline after my father's mother. When I was born, I should have been named after my grandmother, Maria. My mother's mother, but because of my mother's love for daddy, she agreed to name me after his mother, Paulina. Nana goes home to save a place for mama and daddy. I looked over to my mother. She had gone through so very much in her lifetime. I found myself standing with my mother and father, brothers, aunts, and uncles at the foot of my Nana's bed. She was dying. Nana turned to my Aunt Eva, Uncle Tony's wife, and said, I can now die in peace. My son Tony, her baby, is married to a fine girl. Then to my father, Richie, you have a good job now. My prayers have been answered. But turning to Mama, her last words were of me as she pleaded. I have only one sorrow. You will leave my baby alone. No sooner am I in the ground. P.S. Mama could not go to work for a year after Nana died. I found myself remembering Nana Maria laid out in the front room of her apartment. We didn't send our loved ones to funeral parlors in those days. Mama stayed with Nana night and day for the traditional three days as she was afraid the cats might come in and hurt her mother's body. Mama had insisted the windows remain open so her mother's body would not decompose quickly. Maybe it was because I was younger then, only three years old, but unlike with my father, as long as Nana was there, I didn't cry. Everyone around me cried, but I didn't. She didn't talk to me, but she looked like she was sleeping. I can still see her. She wore a beautiful, very delicate mauve dress with lace trim. She looked so pretty, like she was going to a party and was just resting before leaving. I couldn't really understand why people kept streaming in and out, 
lining the six flights of stairs up to our apartment. My little mind could not understand why they were crying, hugging me. As long as she was there, she was alive for me. When my father died, many of these same people streamed in and out of the funeral parlor, but again, it didn't take away the pain. I don't remember my nana leaving the apartment, being taken to church for the funeral mass, and onto the cemetery. I do remember suddenly mama and daddy's bed was back in the front room, and nana was not there. My mother later told me I went to Nana Maria's altar where she had a crucifix and statues of Mother Mary, St. Joseph, St. Anthony, and St. Therese the Little Flower. To my parents' amazement, I began to pray in Italian all the prayers my Nana had taught me. I was crying. When I finished, I went to bed and did not speak another word of Italian for the next 40 years. The day I lost my grandmother, I lost my best friend and my identity. My Italian language died with her. The richness of my Catholic heritage died with her. To be American was to speak English, to leave behind, no, to bury everything that was not American, everything that connected us with being Italian. On that day, not only did Nana die, not only did our Italian roots die, but the Jesus, Mary, and saints of my childhood died, and so I became an American. After my Nana's death, the altar with all the statues who had been like old friends to me disappeared into the dining room china closet, behind closed doors, no more to be seen except when being packed as we moved from house to house. I still have the statue of St. Therese, the little flower, to this day. The altar and the statues were all reminder of what my mother was trying to forget. She was not fair like my father, my middle brother, and me. She looked Italian, and she knew the pain of being Italian in an Americana world. We were born Catholic and American. Everything Mama had tried to bury will not remain hidden. Daddy never forgot he was Catholic, and he loved being an American citizen as well. We were born Americans, Mama, the boys, and I. Our family was born into the Catholic Church. We were baptized, received First Holy Communion, went to confession, were confirmed, married, and died in the Catholic Church. We were Catholic, just like we were of Italian descent, and my father's funeral glowed with the priceless heritage we had inherited. The Mass at St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Church had been resplendent, the music reaching up to the heavens. The flowers that have filled the altar were now part of the procession accompanying Daddy to his final resting place. I guess I kept the pride of being Italian because my father, whom I admire so, was proud of being Italian. Looking around at the brownstone apartment houses that have been a little bit of Italy in the United States, I sadly recall how many of my cousins changed their names and their religion to belong, to get better jobs, but not us. For our immediate family, being Catholic was like being Italian. We were born Catholic and will die Catholic. I wouldn't have changed my Catholic faith out of loyalty to my family. Being Catholic was like being part of my family. You never turn your back on your own flesh and blood. Daddy, you gave me a love for every man because you were every man to me. They tell me that I love everyone. Daddy, you were the first one to teach me how to love. It is amazing how compassionate and aware of our every need our Lord and our Mother Mary are. As everyone knew there was no way to reach me, my mind and heart were free to travel once more to my memories and childhood years with my father. Being a brilliant man, my father surrounded us with cultured, interesting people of all races, religions, and creeds. My father always taught us about different cultures and religions, and I must say our family grew up with respect and admiration for our brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as our Jewish brothers and sisters, Muslims, Hindus, and the rest. He taught me a little bit about a lot of religions, but sadly, I never knew the intimacy with Jesus and Mary that is found in our own Catholic Church. He never taught me the richness, the fullness, the excitement of being Catholic. I had a treasure, 
but not knowing it will cost me dearly one day. I never knew the Eucharist. Jesus physically, truly inside me, a part of me, blood, soul, and divinity. He never taught me how Mother Mary was like my Nana Mary, only Mother Mary will never leave me. My father was a good man. He taught me what he knew, what most of his friends and family knew. He never taught me our Catholic faith because he had never really learned our beautiful faith. But he was a holy man. We went to church every Sunday, no matter where we were. If there was no Catholic church, and believe it or not, there were some villages and are some till today where there are none, we went to a Protestant church. Daddy said, all religions, if people believe in them sincerely, are good. Although I enjoy hearing the Bible stories and the sermons preached in the Protestant churches, I must admit I never understood why I felt an emptiness and loneliness. I only felt Jesus in St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Church on Sudam Street. The day Jesus and I became one. My mind wandered back to the day I received First Holy Communion and was confirmed. My mother did not have to awaken me. I kept waking up all night, checking the clock to see if it was time to get up. I was so excited I could hardly slip into my First Holy Communion outfit. My mother had lovingly bought me the most beautiful white organza dress, trimmed in lace, with tiny white gloves, my first pair of white hose. I felt so grown up and white shoes with a little heel. Finally, ready to begin the six-block walk to church, Daddy took my arm, and Mama waved, assuring me she and the boys will follow shortly. I felt so special. But the neighborhood children, being Jewish, had never seen a girl dressed all in white, and they too were excited. As I was walking down the block, where we had moved two years before, my ears were ringing from the chanting of the children who followed. Here comes the bride. My daddy proudly escorted me up to the aisle to receive my first kiss from Jesus and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I never knew the gifts, the graces, the sacraments, the power, the love that were mine to keep the day I received the sacraments of the Eucharist and of confirmation. But I do remember I was never alone again. I received a presence a light weight on my right shoulder. No matter where I went or who I met or whatever would happen to me, in good times and bad, in my joys, in my sorrows, I would tap my shoulder and say, Stay with me, Lord, you and me, Lord. But now my father's coffin before me, my grief rushed in, blocking my memories, and I could not call out nor feel the Lord on my shoulder. The day had arrived and my father was once again processing down the center aisle of our old parish church, only now he was being carried in. At that moment, I believed nothing could equal the hurt I felt. Little did I know the pain I will know 13 years later. Mommies and daddies do not die. No matter how my mother kept trying to prepare me for the eventuality of this terrible day, I could never accept that my parents would ever die. Why did you leave me, Daddy? My father was a family man. His life was his family, his wife, his children, his grandchildren. They say a good son is a good husband. It's a good father, a good grandfather, a good person. What would I do without him? All the laughter and the tears, the hurts and the triumphs, the pain and the joy, the humiliation suffered because of my roots, and the pride my daddy instilled in me of being Italian and Catholic came rushing to the forefront. I thought when we moved away from the old neighborhood, I left all that behind me. But here I was back, opening the treasure chest of my unforgotten memories, and although loving can be painful, I wouldn't have missed one day of growing up my daddy's girl. Penny was in the limousine, but a little girl named Pauline was crying for yesterday. Not even my knight in shining armor, my beloved spouse Bob, could get through to me. This was the day life forced me to grow up. Mama goes home and nothing is the same. Mama always prayed that she and Daddy will die at the same time, at most minutes apart. But if that could not be, then that the Lord would take Daddy first 
because he will never be able to carry on without her, and no one disagreed with her until Daddy died. Mama was the sharp businesswoman. What she lacked in formal education, she excelled in business and things of the world. She worked in a sweatshop factory from the time she was a teenager. She often told us children that as long as we had our hands and feet, we would never starve, and no job was beneath us as long as it was honest work. She was of the generation who worked hard so that their children would have an easier life. She was strong, or was she? Daddy was a brilliant, sensitive gentleman who adored his wife. I can still remember the time we corrected our mother on the mistaken pronunciation of a certain word. My father turned to my mother and asked, Mama, how do you pronounce that word? She coyly repeated the word as she had said it before. Our father turned to us, his blue eyes flashing, and said, Did you hear, Mama? This is the way you pronounce that word. The day Daddy died, Mama died along with him, only she did not know it. He had been her defender, her faithful husband, her fan club. When he looked at her, it was no secret he sought the most beautiful woman in the world. She was beautiful. Everywhere we went, people stared at her, and she did not wear a stitch of makeup. How many years I wanted someone to say I looked like my mother. Then it happened. One day, Mama turned to Daddy and said, Pauline is beginning to look just like me, don't you think? Daddy responded, She is lovely, but no one is as lovely as you. If there was any doubt as to his sincerity, he had to look at the tears welling up in his sparkling blue eyes. Daddy was the only love Mama had ever known. They married when she was barely 18 years old and Daddy 21. He never stopped loving and seeing the little girl with a 21-inch waist he married, even when after childbearing she grew in size from a size 10 to a full size 20. When Daddy died, Mama was 58 chronological years old, but emotionally there was an 18-year-old alive inside her we didn't know, and so we often did not understand her mode of grieving. When Daddy was alive, he was her interpreter, the mediator between a very warm, passionate mother and wife and her well-educated smartest of children. When he died, we didn't know how to communicate with our own mother. I never knew that it was really Daddy who understood me and so I tried to talk to my mother the same way I had to my father, and she did not have the foggiest notion what I was saying. I could not understand why she cried hysterically when she thought she had misplaced a $10 bill. My father had left her financially secure. While I thought my mother was the one, it was I who did not understand. She was grieving the only way she could, and not understanding, instead of trying to speak her language, I remained in my ignorance and judged her. She was scared. Her strength had died. She was angry. My father had promised her they would live their lives out together, and he broke his promise. He died. Eight years after Daddy died, the Lord mercifully called Mama home to be with her beloved spouse. Suddenly, New York was just a place. My family had been my parents, and they were gone. I was no longer someone's daughter. I had grown up. In my travels to California, I had fallen in love with this new land, so different from Bob's and my New York. And so, in August 1967, we moved our family to California and a new life. Please load our free Bob and Penny Lord app. Here is how to download our free Bob and Penny Lord app. Simply with your iPhone or Android device, go to the App Store, search for Bob and Penny Lord app, and download it. It's that simple. Here's what you can do with our free Bob and Penny Lord app. Number one, the, there's a link to our marketplaces, our websites, uh, our uh, blog, and this podcast. The second link is to our Bob and Penny Lord TV channel where you can access all of our videos as seen on EWTN, plus a whole lot more. Thank you very much.